You are listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KZCC LP Conroe and worldwide at IRLoneStar.com. Good afternoon and welcome to the Legal Connection Show with Tony and Cheryl. We are coming to you from Montgomery County, Texas, Conroe. Uh, we are on IRLoneStar.com, 104.5 and 106.1 Conroe's FM. Tony Lynn Collins and Cheryl ellsworth Jahani. we are two licensed Texas attorneys, and we're here to help you um, just deal with some of your legal issues that come up or your questions, maybe your questions, situations, or your family questions. We're here today. Hi, Tony. How are you doing? Fine. I was just thinking about what you were saying. I got so many text messages this weekend from different people that just needed a little advice, a little bit of legal advice, and I thought, why don't you call in this show? Or yeah, why don't you yeah. just? But it's easier if they get directly to me because they got me on the weekends, and I'm going to respond immediately. But that's what we're here for. That's we're answering right. everybody's questions to the extent we can as a public service. Right, and you can email us your questions uh, to questions at legalconnectionshow.com. Or you can call us uh, and leave a voicemail question at 281-529-5862. Today we are talking about DWIs. So, let's get started. Um, Tony, tell us a little bit about DWIs. Well, before I start telling you about DWIs, I have to start out with a couple of jokes. Oh, good, good, good. And, you know, the jokes that I picked out actually... uh, they actually have a lot of, uh, I think this is why they're funny, because there's a lot of reality to them, uh, which uh, you're going to be helping me pick a jury tomorrow for DWI. Right. And I am not the DWI queen. Like, uh, that's not all I do. In fact, it's a very small part of my practice. But I, I have about, I would say, oh, um, I could have a DWI every day of the week, not myself personally, but I would have a client that would come to me. That's how many DWIs there are in Harrison, Montgomery County, I get calls on. Absolutely. And every one of them is different. Mm-hmm. So here's my first little joke. Okay. This will, uh, I think a lot of our listeners maybe will relate to this. A police officer was staking out a particularly rowdy bar. I'll just add my own stuff here. Off I-45. Okay. For possible drunk drivers. Mm-hmm. At closing time, he saw a fellow stumble out of the bar, trip on the curb. Last week, somebody was tripping. Little girl, I guess I like tripping jokes. Mm-hmm. And, and try And try his keys on five different cars before he found his. Then he sat in front of this, in the front seat, fumbling around with his keys for several minutes. The officer was very excited. Everyone left the bar. Well, he's excited because he was going to get his quota met, I guess, or whatever. Mm-hmm. He didn't know he was going to get something going on with this. Everyone left the bar and drove off. Finally, he started his engine and began to pull away. The police officer was waiting for him. He stopped the driver, read him his rights, administered a breathalyzer test. The results showed a reading of point zero. The puzzled officer demanded to know, how could that be? The driver re- replied, tonight, I'm the designated decoy. <laughs> so everybody got out while he was, you know. So that was the first thing. And I think that. I've never as heard of that. bad as it is, I think there may be some truth to that. Because huh. I was watching, actually, I was sitting waiting for one of my cases to be called one, uh, one day in court in Harris County. It wasn't that long ago. And I was watching, I was just watching a DWI trial, which is public. You can go watch any trial that's going on that's. Unless you're a witness, for the most part, you can be right there in the, the courtroom. Mm-hmm. So I was watching it, and in this particular instance, uh, there was a surveillance camera on one of the other uh, business establishments. And I don't know whether he just watched this one all the time or he had access to it, but but he actually would watch people come out of this bar, and they had this on tape. They, he was just waiting for people to come out of the bar looking drunk. I forgot which restaurant it was. But um, that's how he was getting his... DWI arrest because mm-hmm. he was watching people come out and right. was really pretty sneaky because a lot right. of people, maybe they weren't driving and maybe that's just, I mean, I'm silly when I leave a restaurant and I mm-hmm. don't drink at all. Mm-hmm. So I would be one of the people that, I'm not sure if I, I've never been pulled over and arrested. I've been pulled over quite a number of times for different things, but you know, I don't know why, but maybe I, my driving's not as good as it should be, but, <laughs> but whatever the case may be, um, that's one thing that I thought that, that sort of related to it and to our show today. to this police officer uh, standing outside yeah standing actually outside stalking there. waiting right. to see so yeah. y'all be careful about that absolutely you may not know when you're being uh, that that song in the 80s um i always feel like somebody's watching me yeah <laughs> well, maybe i'll be watching you they really uh, no he's like, i always feel like 
somebody's watching oh, me. Oh, right, right. I remember uh, that. Yes. Uh, and they probably they may very well be. <laughs> so be careful about that. And my other joke is a Texas state trooper pulled a car over on I-35 about two miles south of Waco. When the trooper asked the driver why he was speeding, the driver said he was a magician and a juggler and was on his way to Austin to do a show for Shrine Circus. He didn't want to be late. The trooper told the driver he was fascinated by juggling and said that if the dr driver would do a little juggling for him, then he wouldn't give him a ticket. He told the trooper he had, he told the trooper he had sent his equipment ahead and didn't have anything to juggle with. The trooper said he had some flares and asked if he would juggle them. The juggler said he could, no problem. So the trooper got out five flares, lit them, and handed them to the juggler. While the man was juggling the lit flares, a car pulled behind the state trooper's car. A drunken good old boy from Central Texas got out, watched the performance. Then he went over to the trooper's car, opened the rear door, and got in. The trooper observed this and went over and asked him what he was doing. And the drunk replied, you might as well take my ass into jail because there ain't no way I can pass that test. <laughs> I knew you were good. I knew that was I, you know, I didn't know when I was reading that that he was going to say that, but that is, that, you know. No, that's it's, true. I thought it was funny, okay? Well, no, it's true. And I was reading, you know, and preparing for this about being pulled over and what you should and shouldn't. And that the field sobriety test, and we'll get into that a little bit more, right. are designed to be very difficult. That's right. And That um, you should never voluntarily submit yeah. to one of those tests. Okay, so... Um, what, what are we going to start with here? Do you want to talk about uh, what happens, the process of getting pulled over? Or? Well, I think just to, to kind of, I'll add in that it's, there's a misnomer about um, DWIs and what, uh, uh, being arrested and what have you, um, or, or what, what the requirements are to be charged and to be found guilty of DWI. Mm -hmm. And we were discussing this a little bit before the show. Um, to have a drink and drive is not against the law. Right. To be intoxicated and to drive is against the law. And if you go back, and we'll just kind of touch on this briefly, um, you know, going all the way back to the beginning of time when we have our biblical canons and different, um, and what have you, uh, drinking was was accepted. In fact, it was used as a medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, and basically over and over again, we've got all these different um, uh, scriptures that say that, that basically say, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Holy Spirit. And we were right. just talking about that one. Mm -hmm. And um, but but you can't. The pro the problem is just like back then, you can't drink to intoxication. Isaiah said, "Woe to those who rise early in the morning in pursuit of beer." I didn't even know they had beer back then. Mm -hmm. um, who linger into evening inflamed by wine? Yeah. I mean, I know some people that have some problems, I and know. that that is a problem. It but is. We're, we're, the casual drink that you have at dinner uh, is probably not going to be enough to to uh, make you intoxicated unless you've just got an unusual, uh, the, you know, the way that you process alcohol. Uh, and when you go to a restaurant, it would be, they would be in trouble if they served you alcohol and that was the case. But no restaurants are pushing it, you know, for oh, the most absolutely. part. Well, what about the, the alcohol level? I mean, what is that? I've heard that, you know, that's like a half a glass of wine or a glass of wine. Well, it's and all then... relative to the, the person. So, um, but I will say this, just to, and I'll start off before we go on our break. Um, the, uh, the five things that you need to do if you get pulled over, because the officer pulling you over may not have any idea that you're intoxicated. He may just be pulling you over because you, you know. You have it, a tail light out. It or, could be anything. And right. so, but you may know you're drinking, and so now you're already nervous, and you may not right. have been pulled over before. It right. could be, though, that you weren't drinking at all, and he's just out to get you. Right. So these are the five things that I say, very, very simple things to remember if you don't put them on your visor, so that you need to do. Stop safely if you see the lights behind you. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's the first thing. Just pull over safely. Don't pull out, you know, if there's a place that you can exit so that there's not cars in the way. Because we know people get killed on the side of the freeway or whatever because they haven't stopped riding. There, there are other drunk drivers out there getting you. Stop safely. safely. And the most important thing out of the five is please exercise your Fifth Amendment right. You have the right to remain, remain silent. Use it. Do not talk. If he's already pulled you over, you have no business admitting to anything right. or adding to something to make him think otherwise, him or her. Mm -hmm. So right to remain silent. Field sobriety tests, no, do not do them. Under no circumstances, do them. You don't have to do them if they ask me to say no. Right. There's no requirement. All you do is you give them your license and you give them your insurance and say nothing more. Um, okay. For the, 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 the roadside uh, breathalyzer test, the, the, it's, uh, I forgot what it's called, the PBT. It's the, mm -hmm. uh, the, breath the preliminary breath tester on the side of the road. Do not do it. Do not take it. Yeah, they're unreliable. Uh, they're unreliable, they? and if you, you, you could, anything can set them off. And plus, 
they can't be saved for testing later, so you don't know if the officer's going to be lying to you, right? Okay. And the third is ask for a chemical test, ask for the blood test. And okay. I usually don't say this, but ask for the blood test or the, the, um, the breath test at the station because if you're not drinking, it'll exonerate you. Okay. And, you and you'll get your license pulled from you if you refuse because up on the civil side, a license is, is not... It is a, a privilege. Okay. And so, but if you've been drinking, you're going to pass it. Mm -hmm. So it won't be a problem. But get it done at the station so it'll be tested. If you haven't been drinking, or if you, if you haven't been drinking, no problem. If you have been drinking, then then you may not want to take it at all. So we can talk about it a little bit further okay. later. Okay, all right. Well, we'll be right back after the break. Check us out at www.legalconnectionshow.com. Don't forget to download the Lone Star Community Radio app for your Google Play or Apple Store. Bring Montgomery County's Community Radio with you anywhere with your smartphone or tablet. If you are in the Conroe area, tune in on FM. That is Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1. The Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service has been dedicated to educating Texans for over a century. In 1915, the Extension Program was established under the federal Smith-Lever Act to deliver university knowledge and agricultural research findings directly to the people. Ever since, AgriLife Extension Programs have addressed the emerging issues of the day, serving diverse populations across the state. Texans turn to Extension for solutions in horticulture, agriculture, 4-H and youth, and family and consumer sciences. Extension agents respond not only with answers, but also with resources and services that result in significant returns on investment to boost the economy. Join us Fridays at 1 o'clock for the AgriLife Extension Hour. Legal Connection Show with Tony and Cheryl. Today we're talking about DWIs, and Tony's just been telling us about what to do when you get pulled over. Tony, I'd kind of like to go through a play-by-play -play of actually getting pulled over, okay? Um, so you're driving down the road, and for some reason a police officer is going to pull you over, or you decide that they need to pull you or over. Or you see those lights behind you, right. and you are hoping it's for the car no that's kidding. coming around. That's right. That's but you. then they pull up behind you. The police officer, the question will be, do you know why I pulled you over today? And then your answer should be something like, no, officer, I do not know why you pulled me over. You need to answer in the negative. Uh, and, and as short as possible, less is more. Just be polite and say no. And also make sure your hands are on the steering wheel. Why is that? Well, because you don't know, officers don't know who they're stopping any more than you know how uh, and what's happened in the history of this officer. Maybe he's been shot before. Keep your hands on the steering wheel and wait for them to come to you. Okay. Don't make any quick movements or anything, especially in the, in the environment that we have right now with police officers being shot by really crazy people. Because, yeah. I, okay. as you know, we've represented them before. Public yeah. servants are amazing, and we would not know what we would do without them. Right. But we don't want to give them any reason to uh, to be, be uncomfortable. That's us. right. So, right. hands on steering wheel. Okay, so then the next question the officer will ask you is, can I have your license, registration, and insurance? And your answer needs to be immediately, yes, here you go, officer. Well, I wouldn't even say that. Remember, I'm of the mind, keep your Fifth Amendment rights, uh, exercise them to the extent that you say nothing. So you know he's pulled you over, and you know that immediately he's going to want your ID and your registration. Be getting it. No furtive, quick movements or anything. Right. But That's have good. it ready. Mm -hmm. And if you get in your car, have your license and your insurance handy for you so you're not, like, moving around real fast so that it makes them scared. Okay. And, and, and have it ready just to hand to them. Okay. Very little discussion. Okay, good. We got that. Don't say say as little as possible. Even, then, even if you're not drunk, just say as little as sure. possible. Right. Uh, next question, have you been drinking tonight? Uh, what would your answer be? Well, oh. if he asked you that immediately, mm -hmm. I would I would say, well, you know what? Don't admit to anything. You don't want to lie, mm -hmm. but you don't want to give him any evidence either. You don't have to answer like that. Like I will not The be only thing you that. have to tell a police officer is, is, is you just have to give them your ID. You don't even have to talk. Mm -hmm. Give them your ID and your insurance. Mm -hmm. And if they, they may think you're in a bad mood. They may say, do you understand me? And you can say yes. Yes or no answers, that's it. If you haven't been drinking, I guess you can talk more. The problem is if you talk more and you haven't been drinking, then you're just, 
you're just adding fodder to the possible. You're wasting your time and his for one thing. Well, and two, I mean, don't you think that if you're gonna uh, not, if you're if you're gonna choose your right to remain silent, you need to assert the right. So you have a right to remain silent. Yeah, but if a police officer stops you and he's just because they're just people too. If you say, um, if they ask you, you've been drinking. Um, I want to speak with my attorney. I have the right to remain silent. They'll be like, okay, now I'm going, to, I'm going to do everything I can to try to find out why this person is automatically, you know, acting so suspicious. Mm -hmm. so, Intensive. Um, but uh, I know the few times I've been pulled over, and I haven't been drinking. It's usually just, you know, I'm aware that, like, one time recently I cut through a gas station. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that was against the law, but I, mm -hmm. I was, it, the light was just taking so long. And <laughs> I was late for mass, no, and I was no. like, I wanted no, to get there on time for once. Uh -huh. and, um, and I cut through the gas station. And so... I knew what I had done. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I don't know what I've done, though. One time I did have a, one of my blinkers without the back of my truck, so um, or some light or something. So you don't know for sure. But you can be pleasant, but your answers have to be very short. Absolutely. And if they ask you if you've been drinking, don't you don't have to answer. What about, what about when they say, where are you coming from? Where are you going this evening? Would you answer that? I think uh, based on your other answers, it would be don't answer or no, very wh short. Where are you going to? Um, yeah. Yeah, very uh, short. Be I mean, you can be pleasant, but I'm, I, I just would be really reluctant to even get in a conversation. Okay. Uh, what if the officer says, would you mind stepping out of the car to do some roadside tests so I can be sure you're safe to drive? You know, um, and I've seen my different clients on their videos do totally different things, and I should have an answer for you right away on that, and I'm going to see what your opinion on it is on it. Um, I would never, ever agree to do a field sobriety test. You don't have to. Don't do it. Um, if they ask you to step out of the car, really, in my opinion, you have to step out of the car. You can't just not step. You, you have to comply with the public servant. There may be another reason he wants you to step out, and I don't know what that may be. Right. But um, if they ask you to step out of the car, and that's happened to me before, too, and I was barefoot eating a hamburger right. on 45, and I, I couldn't believe he was asking me to step out of the car. It was kind of cold, and he asked me why I was, at the time, I wasn't thinking anything of it. He asked me, he was interrogating me. He wanted to know why I was barefoot, and I was like, well, my feet hurt, because my feet hurt. And why was I eating a hamburger? Because I had been driving for two hours and I was hungry and there's something against the law. But I wouldn't, didn't want to argue with him. But still, it scared me that he was asking me so many questions. And I'm right. sure that happens to people all the time. And they want to answer. They do. But your best thing to do is not just to have the, the foresight and the wherewithal to keep it to a bare minimum. Yes, no, no, sir, just nothing. I agree. I agree with that. And I think, too, I would add that, you know, you're never required to incriminate yourself. Roadside tests... They're 100% voluntary, and they're not very accurate. And like you said in the last segment, you know, request a blood test, a blood alcohol level test, when you get back to the station, if you're taken to the station. And that's, that's, that's a, you know, you're right on the line on that one, I mean, on the fence, so to speak, because if you know you've been drinking, and let's say you were celebrating a graduation or something and you knew better or you didn't get an Uber or whatever, but you're not quite sure because if you've been drinking, you really don't know. You don't have the wherewithal to kind of pull together unless you're an alcoholic and have been doing this for a while. So you're right. a professional. Right. Um, That's so true. You wouldn't um, be able to know whether or not what your blood alcohol is going to be because I get that all the time. People tell me, oh, I wasn't drinking. I mean, I know I'm not going to I'm not going to have a high. And then they have a bl high blood alcohol level, which does not mean that it's accurate. There's a lot of ways to get around that. But I would say if you know you've been drinking, uh, maybe more than two drinks, that you probably shouldn't, you should refuse the breath or the blood test. Why? Because you don't know how much you've been drinking because you don't have the wherewithal to assess how quickly you've metabolized it or, or right. any of that. I mean, right. you just don't know. So if you don't give them at the police evidence, then you can't be convicted. So say no. Now, what they do now all the time is they get a warrant. So you have to think about it. If you know they're going to get a warrant and you know you're sloshing drunk, then refusing would be sort of again. Yeah. But on the other hand, you buy time because you have to get a warrant. So, right. so you have to really, it's, it's kind of on the line. I generally tell everybody, don't give them any information. I'll just refuse everything. Mm -hmm. Because you can, you can fight those blood tests because a lot of times they're not accurate. You can fight a lot of things, but it's really hard to fight. The blood tests are hard to fight if they're done perfectly. And mm -hmm. that you can't find a break in the title, you can't find anything wrong with it. So I like to say no, but for sure, if you haven't been drinking at all, why not just why not take the test at the station? Mm -hmm. Well, what about failure to take a blood test or a, a breath test will result in uh, in a suspension of your license? Well, it will certainly right. um, automatically if you refuse a blood or a breath. And refusal is not 
uh, people, well, I've gotten clients before that said, I didn't refuse. But the truth of the matter is, they said, I'll do it. No, I don't want to do it. Well, mm-hmm. I'll do it, but I won't do it this way. I mean, mm-hmm. they're really refusing. Mm-hmm. So um, if someone refuses a blood test civilly, and I'm not reading this off anything, it's just something I know. Right. Um, the, uh, the Texas statutes, the way that the laws have been passed, um, you will lose, depending on, if you have a refusal, depending on how many, how high your blood alcohol, that's a, a bad way to say that. If you refuse and you've had a previous DWI, then your the, the your license will be suspended for a longer period of time. Um, if you refuse, your license will be suspended without question. Period. If, if, no matter if you've never done it before, or you have done it before. It's just it depends on if you, how many times you've done this and your your history. So um, if you refuse, your license is a privilege. Um, the Texas Department of um, Transportation, Department of Transportation, the DMV, mm-hmm. you, the 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 state of Texas civilly can take your driver's license away and. The, and the, you will go to an ALR hearing, which is an administrative licensing revocation hearing, mm-hmm. to um, to fight that. Um, which I don't know if we, if we have more time, I can get into the ALR hearings. Um, how uh, much? We have about a minute and a half. Okay. Well, we go to uh, so real quick on that. Um, if you refuse, your license will be suspended. You immediately, when it gets suspended, want to call the phone number or fax to the uh, fax phone number they give you or email. On that, it's called a DIC. You want to get, you want to get in touch of the state of Texas and ask them for an ALR hearing immediately because that prevents you. It's within 15 days, isn't it? Um, 15 days. It says it on there. I always forget. Mm-hmm. It's 10 or 15 days. I, think I believe it's 15, 15 days. Mm-hmm. And you want to call in, and calling in works fine. If you don't have an attorney yet, make sure you call in because that prevents your license from being suspended until you actually have that hearing. So you don't have to get an occupational license. Okay. Because if you refuse. Your, your license will be suspended right. without question. But even if it's suspended, it's 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 not suspended until you actually have this hearing if you call in. I see. So you have to call in. So you can still refuse and you still have your license. And then even, it's not the end of the world, even if you refuse and you don't get the ALR hearing, you can still get an occupational license. Right. And I will get into that a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, today t- you're on the, you're listening to The Legal Connection with Tony and Cheryl and we are talking about DWIs. If you have a DWI or you know someone who does and you need some help or advice or something, you can email us with your questions at LegalConnectionShow.com. We'll be right back after the break. For those of you who like your partners, your gumbo, and your music salty, well, we're here to help with the music. Julian Shea here, host of Lone Star Country Nights Thursday, your weekly dose of roots and Americana and all the music that makes this part of the country special. We stir in western swing, honky-tonk, Zydeco, Texas blues, outlaw country, and put a pinch of red dirt, and then we smoke it over a slow fire. Then listen to the results Thursday nights on Conroe's 104.5 and 106.1 and worldwide at IRLoneStar.com. A Lone Star Community Radio is looking for those who are interested in hosting their own talk show with monthly and weekly slots available on Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and on IRLoneStar.com. Start your own podcast, create your first YouTube channel, and be on TV. Contact Lone Star Community Radio online at IRLoneStar.com or call the station message line at 936 647 3776 to take your first step into the radio world. Welcome back to The Legal Connection with Tony Lynn Collins and Cheryl Ellsworth Jahani. We are two licensed Texas licensed attorneys and we practice in Harris County, Harris County and Montgomery County. We are coming to you from Conroe's FM 104.5 and 106.1. You can also get us tomorrow. Uh, You can download our podcast on Google Play and iTunes. Uh, So we're here today talking about DWIs. Um, So we just got through talking about um, um, some questions about what to do when you're pulled over and all of that. I want to go through quickly for you the penalties for getting a DWI in Texas. And 
Tony had touched on this in the last segment and the one before. It really, the penalties really depend on whether it's your first offense, your first offense with a blood alcohol level that's super high, or your second offense, your third offense. So if your first offense is fines up to $2,000, jail time of 72 hours to six months, and license suspension of 90 days and up to a year. The, set, the first offense with a blood alcohol level greater than 0 0.15 is fines up to $4,000, jail time of 72 hours to one year, and license suspension of 90 days up to one year. Your second offense is $4,000 and up fines, jail times of 30 days to one year, and license suspension of six months to two years. Your third offense, you got a $10,000 fine, jail time of two to 10 years, and a license suspension of six months to two years. And then there's one interesting caveat, not interesting, I think it's important, to the law is driving with a child passenger aged 15 or younger. That ups the ante. You got fines up to $10,000, state jail time of 180 days to two years. Wow. Yeah. And you know, that kind of reminds me when I've, I've, I've done some juvenile law and 15 as a child, I mean, that, that age limit sounds crazy to me mm -hmm. because I don't know if you remember being 15 or if you have 15-year-olds, but that's sort of that age where you're sort of an adult and sort of a child. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of 15-year-olds, believe it or not, that have been driving mm -hmm. with their with their, uh, you know, the license, I forget what the license is right now, what it's called, but it's their... Um, a provisional license. Provi provisional license mm -hmm. and drinking. Mm -hmm. And you're like, mm -hmm. uh, what were their parents thinking? Or, you know, but the kids do that. They, they sneak do. out and their parents are thinking, uh, yeah. you know... They're, they're the, asleep in they're, bed. They're, they're they're trusting their child who's like little Eddie Haskell again, wink, wink, <laughs> I'm all good. And they're Mrs. sneaking out, Cleaver. stealing the, the, the keys and driving around and, and doing all kinds of very adult things with a child's brain, which I think is like a tomato. It's it's not quite farmed yet. It's just, yeah. you know, it's a mess. And when you drop that tomato, you know what happens on the inside of a tomato. Mm -hmm. Well, I think kids must fall on their head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so, um, so uh, that kind of reminded me of that. And um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I think kind of relate to that. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, our, uh, I guess, Ethan here, our, our station manager, do you, uh, do you know the difference between DUI and DWI? Any idea? Um, one is drugs and one is alcohol, right? No. Oh. Um, driving while intoxicated is the charge. It is, it is actually the state law that you are charged with if you're over 21 and driving, whether you're intoxicated through drugs or intoxicated through alcohol. Because just as Cheryl just suggested um, or read to us, the law is um, to prove DWI, uh, in, in fact, that, that would be, I guess I'll read off the things. They, in order to, to prove a DWI, the, 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 the jury or the judge uh, needs to hear or has to be proven by the prosecutor beyond a reasonable doubt your identity, that you were operating a motor vehicle in a public place in Texas while your blood alcohol was 0.08 or higher uh, by introduction of alcohol, drug, or a combination by the introduction of alcohol, a drug, or a combination thereof into the body. Now, you can't have a blood alcohol over 0.08 if you've only been doing drugs, right? Okay. So, right. so but you can uh, be not have, and, and I haven't gone to the additional prong, which is, you don't have your presence, your mental faculties and your physical faculties. Mm -hmm. And that's how they get you on the other, like methamphetamines and that kind of thing. But um, DUI is when you're under 21 and drinking. So that, that's the, uh, everyone says, oh, I got a DUI when they call me. I'm like, well, since you're like 45, I doubt you got a DUI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you mm -hmm. have to be a little bit younger. So the law on that is actually, and I had to write it down because I don't really hear that often. It is um, 21 years or older, you have to have a blood alcohol of, 0.08 or higher to be able to be to show that that you're uh, uh, to be able to prove by a uh, an actual a scientific method that you're intoxicated. Commercial drivers, though, um, if they have a 0.04 or above, that's that, that that will prove intoxication. How much alcohol are we talking about here, though? Well, it depends because um, uh, every body processes alcohol a little bit differently. Right. Um, uh, anyway, the other thing is that if you're younger than 21 years old, any alcohol in your system is enough to prove driving intoxicated. If you're under 21 and you've been drinking at all, which is crazy. Well, you know, they have those little things now that you can put on your iPhone and blow into that will tell you what your breath 
your alcohol content in your breath will read. Have you yeah. seen those? No. Can you they're, buy it at the drugstore? Uh, yeah, they're sold out all the time. I saw it on hey. Shark Tanks. Uh huh. And they sell these little things for three ninety nine. You can plug it into your phone and blow into it. But then again, I'm concerned about the accuracy. I mean, if what the police have, uh, the, the accuracy is debatable. Well, the, their roadside um, PBTs. First of all. They may be lying to you. I know, and they can do that. And they do it all the time because police can tell you whatever they want, pretty much. Mm -hmm. I mean, they can lie to you and not the other way around. And um, if they sh if they're not showing you, I mean, you could blow into it, which is a very similar to a case that I had recently. Um, the police officer they agreed to do the the roadside test, and the, the police officer said, "If you blow into this and you're less than a point oh eight, then I will definitely let you go." But then they didn't show them. And they arrested him anyway. Right. And that was the only thing they had. And yeah. so we don't know if it was accurate or not because they didn't show the result on the camera. Is there any recording of the results? I guess they... unless they put it on the camera and show you. Yeah. But if the police officer is lying to you, they're not going to. But I think if they were telling the truth, they probably would put it on the camera. Right. So um, so anyway, who knows? And they're not accurate anyway. Right. Because if you have just a little bit of alcohol in your breath, then, then it can... Because it's a breathalyzer from your breath, mm -hmm. um, it may show that you've got a high alcohol level when it's really just what's ever in your mouth. And they say mouthwash does that. And you know, I'm I'm skeptical, and as a defense attorney, it's a good argument. But I think if you're on the jury, you're like, oh yeah, right. Somebody just did mouthwash. Now my husband's a doctor though, and he said that yeah, the um, the you can your alcohol level in those breath, the, uh, not the ones that you buy. So I never even knew they had that. Right. But um, he said that that can give you a false reading. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, that's what I was told, but too. But buy it. I would say go buy it at the drugstore and see if you've got a false reading with, test it just for fun. Yeah, even if you haven't been Have drinking. Have a, a girls' night out kind of at your house and say, okay, let's say... Let's say chew gum, and this one will do uh, mouthwash, uh -huh. and this one will, you and know, have, what we get. Uh, do shots. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done that, but that would not, not be a bad idea. Right. right. I was talking to a prosecutor recently, and she said they have, um, like, uh, they test them, so the prosecutors themselves, which, they, you know, the, the people they chose weren't drinkers, right. um, to determine before they did their, uh, like, their first DBI cases, uh, they actually did test on them by having them drink and then monitoring it. And um, it was like a, I forgot what it was, she was called. It was a controlled right. test. Mm -hmm. So they could see how much alcohol they, they drank before they actually felt intoxicated so they would be better prosecutors for those type of cases. Mm -hmm. And the girl I was talking with said that um, two drinks down, um, she was blowing a point one, two drinks down. And I don't know how quickly it was because I wasn't there looking at the parameters and what have you. But two drinks can be enough to. Right. So it just depends on how much you've had to. That's why when they you always say drinks, ask, was it. Liquor, hard liquor drinks? She or? said that it was, um, oh, what did she say? It was uh, vodka and cranberry juice. Okay, so yeah, it was so liquor. It was hard liquor. But uh, that goes to the next part of when you get stopped. And if you do, if you answer questions and everyone thinks they can talk them their way out, and I do not know why, or maybe they don't know any better because they've never been stopped before and asked this, but there are certain things that the officers can and cannot ask you. And they will ask you almost anything. Well, I take that back. There are certain things that you're required to respond to, and then you don't have to answer the others. The only things you have to respond to, of course, are your identity and give them their driver's license. Right. But, they will, but if, if you do answer the questions, then, then bear in mind that everything they're asking you is going toward promoting evidence that are giving evidence that will hurt you. Now, Absolutely. they're going to ask you if you had anything to eat. That's important because how much you metabolize and how quickly is going to have it's going to affect how much alcohol is in your system. Right. They're going to ask you, how, when's the last time you drank? How quickly did it metabolize? Um, they, a lot of, um, I think it's called, um, and I've used this before in some cases a couple of years ago, um, it's the alcohol extrapolation from the blood. And, it, and they use it if you've actually taken the test and you've failed it. Um, or the blood alcohol, when they did the, whatever, when they had the lab and there was no other way to get around it. You can extrapolate it backwards to say that at the time that you were driving, right. you didn't have alcohol in your system because it was rising, and by the time you were tested at the station or wherever it was tested at the hospital, it had reached it had maximum. reached a higher level because you had just drank. You just drinking. So right. the questions they're asking you can hurt you and can help you. Um, I don't know if I want to play the game. Let me just answer the questions right so that it would it would help me. Why not, why answer them at all? Right. Absolutely. But. but we're about to go to break, and when we come back from break, we'll continue our conversation. But we want to reach out to you here in Montgomery County and Conroe. Um, email us your questions. If you're involved in any kind of situation or you know someone who is, we want to help you figure out what you need to do and the best course of action for you, you guys. Questions at LegalConnectionsShow.com. We'll be right back after the break.
A Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's radio station with talk, music, weather, and traffic for Montgomery County. Have a question or comment about one of our shows? Want to know how to reach a host? Just contact the station at IRLoneStar.com or call in and leave a message at 936-647-3776. Get involved with your community with Lone Star Community Radio. Hey guys, this is Connor. This is Dick. This is Chris. And we're with the Ticket Stub Podcast every Thursday live at noon on 104.5 and 106.1 FM in the Conroe area. Also, anytime at IRLoneStar.com. You go to IRLoneStar.com backslash TTS. You can find all of our social media. And don't forget, we give away two tickets to the Grand Theater on every show. If you like movies and you like complaining or celebrating anything that has to do with the silver screen, Check out the Ticket Stuff podcast and join us every Thursday at noon o'clock on Lone Star Community Radio. Welcome back to the Legal Connection show with Tony and Cheryl. This afternoon, we're talking about DWIs. And uh, so we've been going over the law, first offense, second offense, what happens when you're driving with a child under 15, 15 or under. And uh, now we're just going to throw some questions back and forth. Um, Tony, you want to get started with what are, what are some good questions that might interest our listeners? You know, I had so many questions that kind of set out that I was going to read. And now there's, there's such a, a, a broad range of things that people need to know about DWIs. Um, that I don't even know where to, to start on it. So we just have to cover not the particulars of each case because they're all so very completely right. different. Um, I will say that, just kind of going back when I was, I was looking at the, kind of the, the things that I'm missing to tell you, that, um, uh, for an example, when, to be able to prove a DWI, uh, whether you're drinking or not, there are, the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt all of the elements. And... Uh, one of the things is that, and I'm, I'm just doing this, you know, not like my, my outline or anything. Right. Um, they have to prove who you are. They have to prove that you're driving a vehicle. And you ha- they have to prove that you are, you're operating a motor vehicle in a public place. Those, and then, but they have to have probable, they have to have reasonable suspicion to stop you. The very first thing I always look at when I get one of these cases is the constitutional, the constitutional basis for the stop. Because... That, you'll be able to get the case dismissed right away if they have no basis for it. Why did that police officer pull you over? Were they just pulling you over because they were, they were looking for a reason to pull you over? They had to have a reason. So when I first look at the video, and this is why you pay DWI lawyers a lot of money that are good. Right. Because you're looking, the video is, the, uh, the, that's, that's non-testimonial evidence, and it usually will always come in. Mm-hmm. And so you're looking at the video, and I'm looking at it second by second to see what's going on. Are they driving over the line? Are they? If I was somebody behind them on the road, would I think that they were intoxicated? What happens these days is people are driving and they're trying to reach over their cell phone, or they've dropped something, or they're fl- they're flipping around on the radio. Right. right. Um, I personally have got a really bad habit of driving with very little sleep, and and I do, and that's bad. That's worse than being intoxicated. It it can be. But if I'm yeah. that I'm and I don't drink, and so I could be pulled over for that in an instant, but mm-hmm. I kind of snap out of it. Right. Um, I've made it a rule never to drive. Uh, at night, because that's when I'm the sleepiest. Mm-hmm. I just don't drive at night. Mm-hmm. I will have someone else drive, or I'll just stay home or get an Uber, but I don't drive at night. And plus, I-45 scares me, and that's my, my usual path from getting different places. Mm-hmm. Um, but if there's not a constitutional right, if they pull you over and you didn't have a, a light out, or you weren't diso- you weren't you were complying with all of the laws, you didn't have a inspection sticker. If there was no reason, then then there was no reasonable suspicion to stop you. Mm-hmm. Period. So that may be the first way that you can get it dismissed. The second is that it, you have to be actually operating a, a, a vehicle, okay, first. Now, if, if you are, and this has happened a lot of my DWI cases, if you're, if you're um, in a parking lot or if you are, um, uh, all these different examples, if you are at the, on the side of the road and your car is running, it, would you consider that operating the vehicle? Well, no, but I think that how they get them is they're, it's inferred that they had to drive to get to that location. And so. But what if they were drinking in the car? Just like time? pulled over on the highway? Yeah, pulled on the road. And they, they, they were sad or they had a drink because they were alcohol, but they weren't driving. Well, what about the fact that, I mean, I understand what you're saying, but can't the police infer, wouldn't the court infer that if your car is running? No. No inference, no. Really? However, if, uh, and what you're getting at is correct, if you're sitting at the side of the road and your car is off, 
you're not operating a vehicle in a public place because you're not operating a vehicle. Right. However, uh, because they don't have a time frame for that. However, if um, the engine is running, it's considered operating the vehicle. Okay. So if, you, if you're asleep, and a lot of people have done this, unbelievably, their car is running and the keys are in the ignition, but they're in park. You hope they're in park. Um, then that's operating the vehicle. Now, if you are if you are parked in a, a Walmart parking lot, you are not in a public place. Right. The only way that they're going to be able to prove that is if somebody saw you. Or they have, but otherwise, they can't get you. So you're looking at each element and getting rid of them. Uh-huh. Okay? So turn your car off. Uh, so, turn, so turn your car off if you right. have to sleep. That's right. right. But you're right. It's, it's more than likely if you're on the service shoulder and your car is stopped, you had to get there. And right. if there's not alcohol in your car, then you've got some issues there. And remember, it's not just alcohol. It's also other substances if you're mm-hmm. kind of driving crazy. And there's a lot of other defenses. I mean, there you may have a prescription and you're not – you may be driving while intoxicated, but there was a mistake. But – People don't want to be on the road with people that are driving while intoxicated. We have too many deaths for that, and that's why we've got really such strong DWI laws here. Absolutely. It's so um, dangerous. The, uh, the other uh, thing that we were going to get into is uh, first having a child in the car. If you're driving, if they pull you over and you've got a child in the car, and I think you, you mentioned that before, mm-hmm. uh, your, your penalty, if you are convicted of that, is, your charge is, is now a felony, right? Right. Okay. So if you've got a child passenger in your car and you're charged, you're going to be charged with a felony DWI because there's a passenger that's under the age of 15. And that is just crazy because there's so many 15-year-olds that drink, you know, mm-hmm. and, and are driving. And, and they're, they're doing adult things. And maybe they've already been emancipated, like Miley Cyrus or whatever, you know. Right. So that's so kind of crazy that that would be considered a child, but it is. Um, the other thing is open container. Yes. And, um I guess I'll ask our station manager, Ethan, what do you, uh, if you had a, a friend in the car with you that was drinking a can of beer and you were going to go uh, drive down to, uh, I don't know, the beach, the lake, um, and you got pulled over, would would you be in trouble? Um, I would think so, but so would my friend because I'd. <laughs> Has that happened before? Do you know? No, I will not allow that in my oh, vehicle. That is good for <laughs> Just you. because I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble or not. That is right. that is so good because a lot of times you don't know when your friends get in your car, but a bunch of people are getting in all at once. So know your friends. Right. Who has got what on them? That's so true. And if people, I had a girl that I was helping her with her um, child custody case, and I was driving for her because her license had been suspended. She got in my car with one of those little tumblers that you mm-hmm. put, you know, just put drinks in. And I didn't know that she had alcohol in it. And I was furious when we, when we had to go pick up her kid because she's like, oh, well, I have to get rid of this. And it's like, you were drinking? I'm like, and I wouldn't let her take the kid because it's like, you can't be drinking before you get custody of your kid. No. I thought I was in your favor. So you have to be really careful about who gets in your car. You do. And, and you're correct. Um, the law is that a simple open container violation results in a maximum of a $500 fine and a Class C misdemeanor. Um, and if you're arrested for a DWI, just arrested, it doesn't mean that you were drunk. If you're arrested and you have an open container, and it wasn't even your open container, you'll get a Class B misdemeanor and a minimum of six days in jail. So you may not have been drinking. They may just pulled you over to your sleepy or something. But if you have an open container in there, it has some alcohol in it. You're going to jail um, Even for just six a, a, days. a trace. Then, you're min- then yeah, you've, you've lost your abil- ability to plea bargain because you had an open container. An open container means it was within your compartment, not thrown in the, the bed or your truck in the back, but within Within reach. your within your the front compartment. seat. Within the compartment. Okay. Yeah. Or even right behind. A lot of people try to hide it. It's like they do drugs and stuff. Okay. Tony, I have a question for you. Um, if I simply intend to plead guilty, why do I need a lawyer? If I'm just, I've got this DW, I'm just going to plead guilty. Why would I? Well, my first question is, why would you plead guilty? I yeah. mean, I guess if you knew you were driving while intoxicated, uh-huh. you're just going to take your chances? Yeah. Well, I don't know what the book answer is, but you would want to be honest with your lawyer, unlike a lot of my clients who I find out when I see their video what's really going on. Right. I take their case. I'm like, you've got a great case. And then I find out by looking at when I do finally collect the evidence by subpoenaing the officer and the tow truck and, the, and various other things. I find out that they weren't telling me the truth, and they've got a very complex case. Right. And they're mad because they're like, you told me that you were going to help me. Right. You want a lawyer first so they can look at all the evidence and find out just how bad things are. Mm-hmm. Um, and you really, I think that you've got a better position when you're going to court when you have someone that's handled these DWIs before because it's going to be a little bit smoother for you when you go into court, when the prosecutor knows that they're dealing with somebody that's 
on the same playing field as them, which is your attorney. Right. So that they can they can take care of things and, and move it on, and you're in and out of the courtroom a lot faster mm -hmm. than you would be if you're representing yourself. Secondly, you may be you may have an alcohol problem, and your attorney may be able to negotiate getting you help um, with a program through a drug court and alcohol court. Mm -hmm. um, they also may be able to negotiate for you a better deal than the first offer you get. And it could be that you weren't you weren't driving while intoxicated. You may have thought you were intoxicated because maybe you're a little sleepy and you had one beer. It could be that they don't have any evidence to prove that you were intoxicated. And so you'll never know that. I wouldn't you... say that you wouldn't want to lie, but certainly right. you wouldn't know until you got an attorney that that you that they met all the requirements that you were driving on. I mean, it could be that you felt like you were guilty, mm -hmm. but you may maybe you can just go to church and confess to your priest. Right. You wouldn't have that on your record. An attorney right. may be very very easily be able to keep this off of your record. Okay. So um, it's worth at least a consultation and to be very honest with your attorney because if you lie to them, you're just wasting their time and yours. That's so true. And, it, and you know, adequate representation and, and attorneys can also, because they know the legal system, they can minimize or, or get you some sort of a reasonable sentence. Mitigate if, yes. uh, the damages of what they have. Now, uh, that kind of leads to... Um, once you, if you just, if it, if your attorney determines that you um, are going, to, you are driving while intoxicated, okay, but it was marginal, and they think that they may be able to fight the blood evidence. They may, maybe it wasn't marginal. Maybe they believe that the police officer was bad. I had a case like that. I had a police officer who had a terrible record, and they didn't tell that to me. And I knew that he was going to be proven to be a liar on the stand. And all of, and my client had a. Uh, eight charges against him oh, eight uh, for everything because once they uh, they stopped him then they they stopped him for uh, they, there was an open container and then they found drugs and they found drug paraphernalia and then they it was just one thing after another he didn't have a license he had a bad you know it was just he ended up with uh, then he uh, tried to escape <laughs> then they got him for, they got him for escape they got him for all these different things and I ended up getting all of that dismissed why because the police officer had no probable cause no reasonable suspicion to even stop him. He certainly didn't have probable cause. And when I found out that the police officer was lying, and he was a liar mm -hmm. about a number of these charges, mm -hmm. immediately when I when, when I asked for my discovery and I found out the officer had a really bad record mm -hmm. that had not been disclosed to me, mm -hmm. um, they dismissed everything. So, good for you. So it doesn't mean I'm a good attorney. It just means that I did. You, want, you don't want a lazy attorney. You want somebody that's actually going to do your homework. And, and that's going to care about their clients. And well, I don't... care about their client, but do what you're paying them to do. Right. Absolutely. Like a good attorney. Okay. So, um... So that being said, if you do end up going, if, if, if the decision is made, not your decision, but the prosecutor won't let go of the case and you're going to end up going to trial, then there, a good attorney is going to be able to help you. It, there's no guarantee that, if you're, uh, that, that you will win because the jury selection is the most important thing. We'll highlight that for this segment. The most important thing about going to trial is your jury on a DWI case. If you don't pick a good jury, if you don't deselect the right people, then it doesn't matter if you're drunk or not. They may just not like you, right. It may, no matter what the case is. So make sure the jury is, is, is of utmost importance, and I can't get into the details of what questions you ask and what have you. Right. But you want to get someone similar to your client, and you want to make sure that you don't have bias on that jury. Right. Very, very important. Yes. And somebody that, that's not like a, a, a staunch, no, a teetotaler, uh, they think one, well, no, one drink is going to be going to put you under because that's not necessarily the case. In fact, mm -hmm. it's not the case. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so a jury is really important, and also um, the field sobriety test, if you did do them, and a lot of people do them, in fact, most people do them, um, the field sobriety tests are standardized tests that are objective tests. And if the police officer doesn't do them exactly by the book, then, um, then you, can, you can get that police officer on everything he did wrong and show that they didn't know what they were doing, and you, you should be able to get past those. You, can, you have to go past each little step. If you did the breath test, it could be the machine wasn't calibrated correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It could be that the um, it wasn't, uh, for whatever reason, your breath test wasn't done right. They didn't observe you long enough. If you could do the blood test and they take it, um, it could be that the warrant wasn't done properly. Mm -hmm. It could be that the blood was not, the t that the, when they had it, they left it in the car and it, and it, you know, there was alcohol that fermented in it through the blood sugar, your own blood mm -hmm. sugar. Mm -hmm. They could have misplaced your blood and had it was... There's so it was contaminated. There's so many reasons that you should get an attorney. That even if you're driving while intoxicated, not to promote us, right? But I'm just saying that that but not to not promote us. It is us. so important that you not have a DWI on your record because it really does taint what people think about you so much. And people don't realize that too. I mean, that was like the question that we had about you know what, if I'm just going to go ahead and plead guilty. You know, please don't do that. I will say that just to kind of because I know we're running out of time. The um. 
that if you do plead guilty, that there is, you have a lot of options. Um, in Harris County and Montgomery County, um, you know, if, if you find there's just no, if it's going to be on your record, what is your punishment going to be? There, the range of punishment is so broad between all the different counties, mm -hmm. Waller and, uh, you know, the surrounding counties, Montgomery and Harris, mm -hmm. it's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, in Montgomery County, you can get a fine. And a lot of people want that. Just mm -hmm. give me the fine. I want to get out of here. I want to get and in Harris County, you can do something called a step program where you don't even go to jail. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to pay the fine because that's considered going to jail. And you do like a community service if you qualify. And it's hard to qualify. And if you are late for it, it's like working voluntary at the food bank for several weekends. Right. If you miss, if you're even late, you get dumped off that program. And now you've got to pay a fine and go to jail. Um, you can do something where your, your penalty is every, you just go in on weekends. There's a lot of different options for you if, uh, for your penalty. Now, the caveat is if you keep doing this and you're young, you're going to have to fight this because right. people don't realize that you can, after your second DWI and you may not have even been drunk the first time right. or intoxicated, I don't know, you may not have been driving while intoxicated, but you took the plea because you couldn't afford an attorney or whatever. That second one makes it so much more important to fight and you've got this other one on your record. And Absolutely. the third one is a felony. Right. And it is so easy to get pulled over because people get pulled over all the time for things that, and they're not driving while intoxicated. Right. So... I would say get an attorney, even if it's a, a court appointed, just get one, at least run it by somebody. I the agree. Consultation. I agree completely with that. Well, that's uh, going to be a wrap up for today. You are listening to the Legal Connection show with Tony and Cheryl. Our website is www.legalconnectionshow.com. You can email us with questions at legalconnectionshow.com or give us a call at 281-529-5862. Catch us on Google Play and iTunes tomorrow. See you next week, Tony. Thank you. It's been great. DWIs. Thank you for checking out this production of Lone Star Community Radio. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station. Don't forget to check out this show and many others across the Lone Star Community Radio Network. Either live on Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, the Lone Star Internet Radio app, or IRLoneStar.com's live audio stream, and on replay on podcast, Channel 12's Our City TV in Conroe, or Channel 21 KVQT in Houston, and of course their YouTube channel. This production is copyrighted and all rights are reserved by Lone Star Community Radio. Have a question regarding this program or other Lone Star Community Radio shows? Want to sponsor or start your own show? Call the station message line at 936-647-3776 or email the station at lscrstudios at gmail.com.